Hi, everybody. Dr. Joan Ifland here, and I am here with an incredible guest, Joe Grover, who is working on a new way to make us behave the way we want to behave and think the way we want to think and have the health profiles that we all want. This is groundbreaking work that Joe is bringing to us, and we're very grateful to have her here today. I'm going to let Jo introduce herself. She's got very impressive credentials and tell us how she came to be in this space. Of, it's functional imagery training. That's right. FIT. Yes. All right, take it away, Jo. Thank you. And um, thank you, Joan, if I may call you Joan, since I feel like mm -hmm. even though we just met a cancer schmancer. Jo Joan. <laughs> yeah, we're friends. Um, and we, we share a passion um, for this subject matter. Um, so thank you for having me. And and most importantly, like, thank you for what you do. Oh. I feel like there's, um, you know, there's a tidal wave coming at us and you're like one of these rays of hope. So um, I'm- I feel delighted. the same way about you. That This is, that the hope comes from healing modalities, brain changing modalities that are not known. And good people like you are out there spreading this, this, it is hope. It, it, it's not just hope, but it's it's delivery of changes, improvement. Science-based hope, if we may, right? Stop it, suffering. Yes, yeah, stop suffering. All right, tell us how you got here. Yeah, so it was actually suffering that brought me here. Um, uh, my background, as um, some of you may know, is as a, um, a therapist. So I was in private practice in New York and Miami, and um, focusing mostly on cognitive behavioral uh, therapy for the treatment of anxiety. There was no shortage of that. So um, business was great. And then um, I hit a wall. Um, I, I ride horses for fun. Um, and I was in a competition in Kentucky and I was on a young horse and we had different ideas of what this fence in front of us was gonna be. I've learned in life, one cannot ride with one foot on the brake and one on the gas. It doesn't work out that well. So um, I wound up flying in the air and um, having a moment of like, what's gonna happen when I land? You know, time was sort of moving quite slowly. And when I landed, I crushed um, my left shoulder. Mm. Um, yeah, so it, it required a lot of rehab. So two surgery, I had two plates and nine screws and cadaver bone. And mm -hmm. um, there was a moment when I was really struggling. I didn't want to take like pain pills because I had seen a member of my family um, battle that addiction. And I had committed that I wasn't going there. But I was facing such, such excruciating pain that I couldn't sleep. And without sleep, I couldn't heal. Mm -hmm. And um, and that really led me on a journey of like, what else is out there? And that led me to become the first person in the U.S. to study functional imagery training, um, which is backed by 20 uh, years of research. So I, um, when I went over there to study it, I practiced it first on myself. And because I, I had gotten through the rehabilitation, now it was, could I get back on a horse? Mm hmm Mm -hmm. um, and could I, you know, jump again and do all these things? So it really, it it helped me silence some of the the chatter in my head. And then I started using it with clients, and I found that it worked much faster than thinking. Right? Yes. Or much more powerful than than um, talking. I should say we're always thinking. Yes. Images are super powerful. And and, and just if I could just jump in here, in what way? What was the result? Was it relief from the anxiety? It was redirecting. I think I reclaimed my attention. When we are injured or we're in pain, we immediately go to fear. And mm -hmm. then that fear can sort of feed on itself. And mm -hmm. we're constantly looking for reasons to be fearful or things in our environment that are going to jump out and get us. Mm -hmm. And I was in fear mode. Um, my heart was in fear mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I was able to redirect that. And it's sort of, uh, it was a little bit like fly fishing in the beginning. You know, I had to kind of like keep redirecting and redirecting. But once you get the hang of it, the really amazing thing that I found with imagery and my clients found is that it, it keeps working. 
it's not it's, just yeah like a, you're full, building full a capacity heart. in your brain you're you're building a, a neuro pathway it's neuro sculpting a capability into your brain so that if you cue it it will just go do what it's what it's trained to do that's yeah. kind of how I think about it do you think that's fair no, I, I think it's sort of like where we, you know, where our attention goes, energy flows. It's like as simple as that, right? And and the more we use it, the better we get it, the more we trust it. And the more we, belief, I know you and I haven't talked about this that much, but belief is so important. Do we believe? Everything. It's everything. Do we believe yeah. we can get better? Um, do we believe that we can heal? Do we believe in our doctors? Do we believe in our our counselors, our friends? Mm -hmm. So now you've created a, a consulting training company here in the U.S. Tell us about that. Sure. So um, the training that I went to was great, and it was taught by the researchers. Um, but I found Plymouth, that in Plymouth, Plymouth in the U.K. Yeah, we um, are very close to them. In fact, my co-founder is one of the research team. He's one of the founders of functional imagery training, Dr. Jonathan Rhodes. We, he approached me to write a book together, and in writing that book, um, we developed a company around it because the training was amazing, but I thought, like, how do we translate this so that it's it's um, palpable and practical and relatable to, you know, to, we originally saw it. Million, millions of people are suffering so bad now. We know 93% of the U.S., 93% uh, of people have either high triglycerides, tri high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high blood glucose, or a high waist to hip ratio. The suffering out there is just, it seems almost endless. Yeah. And so, and I, yes, when you can give somebody a tool to, to reduce suffering, to pull us away from the, the toxic influences of our culture, Oh my gosh. I mean, that's why I was so excited. Joe, we didn't say this, but Joe alluded to it. Joe and I met just maybe a month or so, less than a month ago, at an event put on by Fran Drescher, who okay. you'll remember her from The Nanny. She had uterine cancer after the show and she beat it. And she's been promoting cancer recovery ever since. It's 17 years since she conquered her cancer. Mm -hmm. So Joe was the speaker at um, nine, out of nine speakers. Joe and I were two of the speakers. And we, I mean, I looked her up before and I said, I've got to talk to Joe. Oh, that's so I've funny. I looked you up. Her. And then I think, I, so I found you and I loved your answer. You said, well, I need more. I need to read your research. And I was like, awesome. Because mm -hmm. you didn't just take it at face value. And mm -hmm. so the, I love that we were, there was a lot of synergy there. I had looked at all the speakers and I was like, I want to meet her because that one, <laughs> yeah, because she's really like, she's what you're taking on is so big. And, um, and, and then in your presentation, you talked about cravings and I was, so you actually, I owe it to you for throwing my whole speech off because I threw the speech that I've worked on so diligently out the window because I thought I'm going with I'm I'm going to piggyback on this and we're going to talk about cravings and that was not at all in my original speech. Well, you're I you know cravings are created just like you're talking about creating a pathway in the brain to keep people safe and in a health uh, on a healthy path. There are the neurologists at the food industry are working very hard to create craving pathways to keep you on the path of buying their not just worthless processed foods but very toxic processed foods oh, they have scientists working you know these massive companies international big i mean they don't even want you to know their names but they have scientists working to do nothing else but addict you to smell to taste and we're taking that same science that they're using in a really practical way and showing you how to take control of your life all right go good that's that's the connection go the, we're, we're fighting specifically uh, yeah we're all fighting there are I, i'm going to do a workshop on this these are the people 
we know from Thank internal you. documents who who brought the Marlboro Country Store and transformed it into the wacky warehouse for sugar addiction to children, the wacky, the Kool-Aid wacky warehouse. And there are explicit documents inside the University of California, San Francisco's depository. So yes, Joe, tell us. No, no, I'm sign me up. I'm I'm listening to that. When you start to talk about that, like I'm there. Um, so uh basically our we want to think logic drives human behavior, um, but the truth is emotions do. And emotions are imagery based, they're sensory based. They know that, you know, whether they're selling you a, a processed soda, you know, that the sound of the, the, um, the, you know, when you pop it open and the sound of the fizz and that they're really building that up in the commercial, right? We're going to build it up in your um, in your imagery ability, right? So okay. we all have goals. We start at the beginning of the year with um, sometimes resolutions, many of us, right? But the truth is that the majority will drop out before the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, so in the beginning, when the folks who developed um, functional imagery training, they were looking specifically at cravings because cravings hijacked logic. The logic was, I need to stop doing something or I'm going to become very ill or I'm going to even die. But then a craving would happen and it may be a smell, a taste. You may drive by some place that has a memory of, of having something that was bad. Or see a person. Yeah, so suddenly you're hijacked by a craving and that's bound to happen. We teach you that that's gonna happen, but we teach you that you have this ability to change the channel. So, and the more you practice it, so you start to imagine what it's going to be like to be healthy, what it's mm -hmm. going to be like, what, what happens to the people around you? What, what do you smell? What do you taste? What's it like when your feet touch the ground in the morning? These mm -hmm. are very immersive experience. What emotion are you feeling? We work in the realm of seven senses. So it's the five that we're aware of. And then we also add emotion, which without that, we won't change anything. If mm -hmm. you're not emotionally attached to the image, Mm -hmm. This very little power it will have over you. Oh, uh, that's key. If you're not emotionally attached to the image, it won't have the power. Yeah. Okay. And number seven is um, movement. No, so, so cool. So yeah. Cool. So and the, the movement part really puts you in the driver's seat. You know, mm -hmm. can you change this scene? Can mm -hmm. you move into this frame? Can you literally so move? like move your body or just move yeah, but not body. literally move but imagine moving your body oh okay 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 wow this is so cool joe it's so cool so when people get good at it even you know it, so um we had talked a little bit about the the weight loss study when we met um and so in that study which what turned out to be um the most significant weight loss study um ever without the use of medication and that was the functional major training this is your team this is a study your team ran. well this is at the university of plymouth right so the um the original uh developers of it so it wasn't my company but it was the university um, yeah 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 but it's what got them you know on the map and that's one of the reasons yeah. why i knew about them but people didn't just like lose weight or, or and stop snacking or stop eating sugar. It worked in other areas of the life. And it just didn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to lose these 15 pounds and then boomerang. Like once they started on this journey, they continued to lose weight. So it was mm -hmm. six months later, a year later, they were still getting healthier mm -hmm. because once you realize that you control the channel clicker, like you are taking the power away from these major you know, uh, for-profit institutions that want you to become addicted, that you this want you to become, um, you know, a once, zombie. Basically. Once you know how to change the channel, they've created channels. They've created TV channels inside your head. This is what they're good at. Training your brain cells to release thoughts of their products in, in response to lots and lots of different triggers and, and cues and reminders and food stimulation. It's diabolical. So what you're saying is, yes, okay, great. There's a great big, huge processed food channel. There's a video game channel. There's a gambling channel. There, oh, there's a romance novel channel. All of these 
diabolical neurologists have trained my brain cells to, to run advertisements inside my brain. But what you are saying, Joe, is you've got the remote control. You can click away from all those channels that those neurologists have implanted in your brain really and you have control. control. Yeah. So if like, so we, um, my business partner and I, we started working with athletes, right? I'm an athlete. I love, for me, that's how I de-stress. So I, I row with a team. I, you know, um, I swim, I run. And, but so this really began like athletes can do it really well. They call it visualization, but we take that as one of our, we trained recently a um, police officer who said, you taught me like visualization on steroids, right? He's a counselor now in the police department. So um, the great thing is the ripple effect of this work, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, but it is really like, we talk about cues. Um, if you look at a, like a great tennis player, right? So Martina Navratilova wrote the forward to our book, but if you, it's amazing. Some young people I talked to were like, who's that? Um, she was the tennis player of my generation, but if you look at like Rafael Nadal, right? When he's playing, he uses cues to cue himself up for a serve. So it's a certain amount of tapping. It's, or if he gets distracted, sometimes a member of the crowd is heckling. He'll stop the game, you know, say something to the ref, and then you will see him use his physical cues. And that those physical cues are really important to our work. This is brilliant. That, that That's silences funny. the noise, whether it's a heckler in the crowd or whatever, and you can get back to your game. You can get back to your goal. You're not. He's created a whole, not just a pathway, but dang, this is a 12 lane highway from that cue to whoosh, I'm in my A game. Yeah. And those cues are really critical. We, we trained um, a social worker. Actually, she's a marriage and family um, therapist who said, I never realized the importance of a cue. She was doing a mindfulness workshop. She's trained with us. And it was for judges in, um, in Kentucky. And mm -hmm. um, their cues, they all decided their cues would be their robes when they put their oh, robes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she said this courthouse was quite a bleak, you know, even the smell, like everything about it was rather bleak to her as an outsider. But to those judges, when they put on their robe now, they connect to why they became a judge. They connect to their core values. And she sort of left it there and thought, I don't know what they'll do with this. And they contacted her and said, they talk about their cue over lunch now. And they've added other cues. So, you know, it's it's quite amazing when you start- oh, This is just so exciting. And what I really also like about it is, you know, you have a body. So if your cue is to tap, say like an acupuncture point, you can do that anywhere. You can do that on an airplane. You can do that while you're waiting in the doctor's office. It's something, you know, you don't have to get dressed and go to a meeting. It's easy and it's immediately accessible. Yes. Uh, it's yeah. a, a cue can even be a phrase. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it can be, you know, what we, we measure someone's imagery ability because we all think we imagine the same, but the truth is you may be more visual and I may be more uh, tactile. Somebody else may really struggle with visualization. So, so we're going to find what works with you for you. Mm -hmm. And even when you feel um, where it's weak, there are ways to develop it. Because the more vivid we use this imagery, um, the more, the, the better the outcome. It's almost well, I heard you say earlier that if you can activate an emotion, I'm probably not using exactly the right words, that it's going to be more effective. So Tell us how you would integrate an emotion into like a tapping or a phrase. Sure. So the emotion is really, it's not so much the tapping. The tapping will trigger the emotion because the emotion is what they want, right? Mm -hmm. so the emotion is attached to what it will be like to see their grandsons uh, get married or, you know, to see something in the future that if they don't change their behavior, they may not be here for right? Oh, brilliant. Okay. So now you're creating have, basically a longing, a desire, an urge. Yes. Yes. Um, in the case of, um, so my, my um, co-founder works with the um, British commandos. 
Mm-hmm. And they have a grueling training where they're in the British moors and it's cold and it's dark and there are these little divots with snakes hang out in. And they there's a um, a car always nearby that's warm and has coffee. And you can quit at any time. All you have to do is say, I quit. But that means you're not going to be a commando. So mm-hmm. with those commandos, wherein they're in that situation, um, uh, they're now trained to think of standing on that podium, getting that awarded the commando medal, who they might be doing it for. It might be for a member of their family. It might be for their kids. But that overrides that you know, desire to quit. So much so that we found that we have to tweak it. Like people will persevere through pain um, when the emotion is great of what they want. So Mm -hmm. um, learning how to infuse it with just the right, but it's amazing how in in your mind, Joan, in my mind, whether it's overcoming a shoulder injury, we have the ability to transcend pain depending on what. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. You can release your own opiates. They can travel over to the nerve endings for wherever the pain is coming from. Uh, yeah, the, this is, I hadn't thought of that, but that's how you started out talking about this, is that you were using imagery to recover from a painful shoulder injury. So yeah, go straight into that. How would you use this to manage pain? Um, well, it really is about, so it's not about pushing the pain away. Right. So um, I love uh, meditating. So one of the Buddhist meditations I do, we breathe in the suffering. Right. And we we send out a relief of that suffering, whether it's to another being or to ourselves. So we, we invite it in. Right. So we can almost examine it. You're not saying you're not allowed to be in pain. But mm-hmm. then it's really, you know, what are you what are you working toward? Right. No one's working to be in pain. So. Okay. I was, um, for, in my journey, it was really seeing that what was on the other side of that and attaching to that and realizing that if I wanted to spend quality time with my kids, um, with my partner, that, you know, I was, what that would look like, you know, what that would Mm -hmm. smell like, what that would taste like. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was able, I was able to then allow the pain to be but to focus on where I was going. And and the more vividly that happened, the better I was at transcending my where I was in that moment. Okay, so this is another channel clicking. Uh, you have an injury, or imagine this would work on emotional pain as well. Somebody has betrayed you. You're experiencing pain, but this is, a, you get out your remote control and you click away from that channel to a a different channel, a channel that's filled with love and warmth and happiness and joy and gratitude and all good things. Amazing. Yeah, Yeah. and and, um, I I know some people listening may say, how how can that be? And, And first of all, I wanna acknowledge that like, it's really hard to be a human suffering with addiction. I have it, um, I've seen it up close and personal. Um, yeah. so no way do I want to make something seem like, oh, it's so easily treated. Oh no, no, not it's not trivial. This is what yeah. we're talking about is a what what I I haven't developed your skill set, but in my own mind management, addiction management, these are skills that you develop, you hone, you maintain over months and months and years, and then you maintain them for years and years. You have to be around people who are doing the same thing so that your brain is, your your drive to be normal is engaged and satisfied, et cetera, et cetera. I know one of the things I loved about you when we met is you said mirror neurons. And I thought I was the only nerdy person like who like loved mirror neurons, yeah. uh, the most active neurons in our brain, right? So when we see someone doing something and we're watching intently, it's it's almost like we're doing it right? So we are doing it at a 20% level. Yeah. Our brain, the same brain cells are active in our brain at a 20% level. And that will depend on how well we know the person and how well we know the behaviors that they're exhibiting. It can, you know, range and impact. 
Yeah. But it, that drives your, the core overriding drive in the human. If you can really get this deep on the inside, you will, you can radically change your life is to be normal, to fit in, to be accepted, to belong to a group of people. And your brain will drag you to whatever group of people is available. And so picking your group is a big part of the, the, the pathway to maintaining something like using this imagery. Joe, you're in a group. You are working with yeah. other researchers. You're working with your clients. You're keeping this fresh, constantly refreshing. This is what I'm making up. And it's constantly being refreshed in your mind as you see somebody use it and get a result or your researchers, your co-researchers find a new explanation for the biological mechanism of it. But yeah, it's, active, we, it's up and active in your mind. Is. And as we share this information, so I was talking to Jackie Andrade the other day, Dr. Andrade, who developed- um, Who's also on your team. Yes, um, and hopefully we'll be working uh, together uh, with your team. Um, but when I said to her, you know, part of the people we train, they're saying like, well, you're training the, an individual to use this, but then you're sending out them, you're sending them out to a system that's broken. Right. So how can we expect change to stick? And I was so surprised by her, her response because she's not a salesperson. She said um, what they have developed is resiliency, no matter what's going on in the system. Mm, good point. Good point. And that's what they've seen as a thread throughout the 20 years of research is it's the individual's resiliency to persevere despite what system they're in. This is Angela Duckworth's work on grit, mm -hmm. perseverance, determination. It's it's a mm -hmm. um, mindset, uh, Carolyn Dwork. And, or, you know, in yeah. the Angela scale, it, um, it's passion and perseverance. It's two things. So we, we mm -hmm. can't forget the passion, right? We can't just persevere and expect to be resilient if we don't have passion. Like you get up in the morning, and you do what you do and you persevere because you have a passion for ridding the world of processed food and processed food addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get up in the morning um, for wanting the world to have a little less suffering and wanting us to have some ability to see through uh, the mess that we find ourselves in. Yeah. And to, yeah. to innovate. The, the really cool thing is um, there's no downsides side to your imagination. What, right. um, and in fact, when you imagine you are utilizing the hippocampus in the brain, and when we do that, it's naturally de-stressing you because when we're stressed, the hippocampus recedes. So our ability to imagine a different future shrinks. Interesting. Wow, that is super interesting. There's a physical reaction to stress, which is the ability of the brain to imagine shrinks. Wow. Yeah. So wow. Imagine, think of that with kids who are stressed. Think of that with people who like the only, the way that we're going to get out of this mess, I think, is through innovation, through creative ideas, through coming at a problem from. But if we're all stressed and no one's innovating it's really a um it's a much worse scenario right. so when you get into your senses when you vividly imagine the amazing thing about the brain is neuroplasticity right so you can even though it may be shrunk right now you can expand this part and in doing so you de-stress and you can do it with your thoughts mm -hmm. and what you're saying is the best way to do this or a really really powerful way to do this is through imagery yeah. I mean, yeah. thoughts are attached to images, right? And what we know from the Human Genome Project is we have 6,000 thoughts a day or more, depending on how stressed you are. Six right? or 60,000. Well, anywhere between. There's a whole debate, right? Okay. So between six and 60,000 and 80% um, are negative, generally. Um, mm -hmm. And then 95% are pretty much as the same as the day before. So we're really wired to resist, you know, we're wired to resist change, um, at least right now. But if you can vividly imagine something before it happens, 
you're almost tricking the brain into believing change has happened. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we were working with um, a first time CEO and he was in a really stressful um, situation of having to prepare his first slide deck, right? So there's a whole group of like an outside consultants agency that prepared the slide deck. And the night before he's running through, he's using his imagery because we have people use imagery to prepare for the next day. What's uh -huh, your day? Uh -huh. On who's there? And in his experience, he he had a thought, which was, I forgot to see if they added the last slide. I didn't check. And now mm -hmm. it's late at night and he can't check and his presentation is the next day. There's nothing he can do about it. So in his old state of mind, he would have ruminated about that all night. Instead, mm -hmm. it his imagery of, okay, how will I handle that? If that slide isn't there, how will I handle it? Mm -hmm. And he pictured the crowd, he pictured the slide not being there, how he'd recover from it, what he, you know. And so lo and behold, the next day, it happened. The slide wasn't there. But mm -hmm. no one really missed a beat. He was prepared for it, right? He said, had he not done that, had he not used his imagery, he would have lost his temper, he would have lost his place. So we use it a lot, just like an athlete would in preparation. 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 Yes, you're writing a play. We call it writing a play. But mm. if you do, it is, it, it's just shocking to me how well this works, how, how worthwhile it is to train in this. You know, yeah, we, and there are so many tools, right? Like I'm sitting next to a bookshelf, right? So we, we teach people that you may have a thought that comes into your head. Spontane spontaneous thoughts happen all day long, right? And it's a thought you don't really want, right? Like maybe you know, you're in the middle of a, a meeting and this thought comes in your head. And we never say stop or block that thought, but take it and put it on the shelf and set uh -huh. a that you're going to take it down later and visit it. This so it's respectful. It's, respectful. it's like I'm honoring the thought. Mon yeah, which is really important rather than blocking or stopping or I don't want to have that thought, but... I'm in the middle of something right now, whether it's a tennis match or a meeting or, and I'm going to come back to that later. And it's really important that people come back to it later. Um, what if it's something that they just never want to think of again? Like I had an experience where um, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, a person tried to um, transfer my inheritance to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it, it was very, very hard to stop. And I, I took action, you know, I got the lawyers and blah, blah, blah. We got it all sorted out. But it took a whole year. Mm -hmm. And I really did. There were just it was a year when I was writing the textbook. One of the three years I spent writing the textbook. I just didn't want to be thinking about it anymore. Uh, I, and I and there was a per particularly just toxic person involved in the whole thing and I would just found it so difficult to take my mind off just running the grievance the grievance gremlin was just trampling all over my brain yeah no I think that um well you bring up thank you for sharing a personal story um that always takes courage um but there is new evidence that like Recycling a grievance or talking about a grievance is really counterproductive because you're reliving. Oh, the yes. You're just digging that that highway deeper and deeper. Yeah. But if you take it down more with curiosity, like what happened here? You know, what got triggered for me? And what am I going to do to make sure that there's something like this unprotected from this in the future? It could be three simple questions, but ruminating on an emotion or a grievance. Yeah, that isn't you don't you would not want to keep taking that book down because it wouldn't be helpful. But if there's some productive kind of altitude that you can get on it, um, because that file otherwise just stays open. And oh, we're it's awful. We it's awful it when that happens. So, yeah. so um, it is important to, to kind of make peace with it. Otherwise, it's, it tends to bubble up in another area. Um, right. And and right. it's best to do that in the safety of like you can do that with a counselor or a therapist or somebody where you feel seen um, and supported and safe. Yeah. But, yeah.
I finally got to the point where I would stand in my living room and I would just say over and 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 again, I've done everything I can do for the moment. I've done everything I can do. I've done everything I, I, I've done. I've done everything I can do. You know, let me get back to work. And yeah, so that was your mantra. That was your cue. I've done everything that I can do. And then you would redirect, right? I and, and then I, redirect. I really that. Like I've done everything that I can do. Yay. All right. So you've put all of this wisdom and research. There is research on this. You guys know I do not bring anything to the table that doesn't have research behind it. This has research behind it. And um, Joe has written a book about it. So tell us about the book and where people sure. can get it. Uh, okay. So the book will be out in June. Super excited. It's called The Choice Point. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I co authored it with Dr. Jonathan Rhodes. And it really it's practical. And it's about the mind, how the mind works and how you can use it to get, rather than further away from your dreams, closer to them. So it's a very practical guide. And um, we're hoping to launch a choice point, like a social media campaign. And the way this came up is my sister, who is always, she has a hard time getting up in the morning and working out. She's listening. She's going to be like, Why'd you have to say that? But um, but uh, we're sisters, right? We we try and motivate one another. But she sent me a, a screenshot of herself at the gym uh, early in the morning, and she said hashtag choice point. And uh -huh. and I thought, well, here's a collective movement, right, where we're all reclaiming our choice points because the average choice is made in a two second window. Do I reach for that? chocolate cake or do I reach for the apple? Do I stay in bed scrolling or do I get up and do something that, you know, is something I want to achieve in my day? Mm -hmm. um, and if we, when we use imagery, we expand that point by a few seconds mm -hmm. and then make the choice that supports your goal. So this whole idea of a choice point is using that opportunity, you know, as Viktor Frankl said, between stimulus and response is a space. And in that space is your freedom. It's our freedom, right? And are we going to hand it to the processed food industry? All with, those neurologists with, at all the industries. Giving them our money and our mind and our body and our health. Or are we going to like say enough of this? Mm -hmm. like, like I have dreams. I have a passion. I have grit. And I'm going to use this like skill that everyone has. I, I have yet to meet a client who didn't have this. I believe everyone has this. And when so this is the, the, this is something that I'm really resonating with. It's a new tool right now. And it's something like I encourage people to become aware first, uh, go through a process of kind of running inventory. Where could I use this? Where could I use this? So this is a, a new tool that you would, oh, Oh, I am at a choice point. Yes. I'm at a choice point. Mm -hmm. uh, you can hear it, you know, the cravings are building or the the paralysis from depression is building. Oh, oh, oh. So these are incredibly valuable words. I'm at yeah. a choice point. I'm at a choice point and I can use my imagery ability. I can use these seven senses to navigate this. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to basically be craving my dream mm -hmm. rather than craving the stuff that's going to make me sick. So it's really, it's really essential what I'm making up about what you just said to get a really, really clear picture of the dream. Yes. And that's where, um, you know, I, I don't want to leave this out, but we use a technique called motivational interviewing because mm -hmm. you can never be my dream for a person, even if it's my own kid, you know, it can never be your dream for a client. It's every individual getting clear. And, you know, we live in such um, sort of like inundation of information that really getting clear takes time and takes when you work with someone who's been trained in the motivational interviewing, especially when they're really good at it, you're very good at helping people get to what they want rather than what everyone else around them wants. Wants for them. So yeah. this is something that I've just started to, to conceptualize, which is where is the source 
of your thoughts and behaviors. And because you know, 100 years ago, uh, 70 years ago, 75 years ago, we did not have screens. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to remember, but television came into existence in the 1950s, 70 some years ago. Before that, we had radio. Before that, we didn't have radio. We only had live performances. Now that we have screens and messaging can be bombarding us literally 24 hours a day, the, the source of decision-making has moved out of us. We're now looking for information about decision-making from outside of us, a screen delivering information to us. But, where, but the best information comes from inside of us. It Absolutely. comes from our reptilian brain. It comes from our hearts. It comes from our gut. It comes from our frontal lobe. The best information, the, the, the greatest source of expertise about the best thing for each of us to do comes from inside of us. It's our own intuition. So what I'm making up about what you're saying is that it would, and of course, anything that comes to us from a screen is, we don't know whether it would work for us or not. But if it comes from inside of us, it's much more, now, not the addiction inside of you, not the advertisers messages that have gotten stuck in your brain. You've got to learn to evaluate your messaging. But, but this yeah, is a method for getting the source of information to come from inside you. Inside you. And, you know, I was just visiting with my dad and mom yesterday. My mom's 90 and my dad's 95. So my dad you know, to, he still calls the computer the magic box. Well, look that up in your magic box. And he, you know, he came when he was a student, when he was a kid, they had just had radio, there was no TV. So it's amazing to see how it's changed. I think the biggest struggle um, that we face is just like, not, we we're just so used to imme the immediacy. Well, I want to mm -hmm. take pill, the immediacy. Well, I want, I want some magic, you know, potion that I'm going to order on Amazon will be delivered to my door. This is something that you really have to quiet, get in touch with, with your, your, yourself, which takes a little bit of, um, a lot of being present and then practice it, the, and the, the wonderful thing is we've trained people who are now working in parts of the world where they don't have access to Wi-Fi and they're mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's so amazing because you're teaching we're teaching what's already there like we don't have to manufacture it we don't have to have a login you know you just have to um get into the human mind and body yeah yeah so what would be a first step for somebody who wants to and the thing i just go back to something i said right at the towards the beginning the thing i like about this is that i believe i have clarity about where disease is coming from, where suffering is coming from, where pain is coming from, where uh, in, incapacity, disabilities, it's coming from these neurologists at the corporation and their ability to manipulate our brain functions so that we buy products that hurt us tr tremendously, take our lives away, a kind of a living mortality kind of. Um, so let's go back to what you what you said. It's imagery fighting imagery. It's imagery. It's using what they have developed. Why? You know what was the big shift? It was in the late 1990s, I think, when brain imaging technology became available, and then these neurologists could really hone in, and they could make it really effective. And they're killing a million Americans a year. A million Americans a year die from diet-related diseases. So imagery versus imagery. Can you tell us, like, how does that work in, in the brain? Is it, are you changing just a, a, a brain cell or is it firing of a brain cell? When a, um, you know, when a neurologist shows me a, a, a red can and I hear the sound of that pop and Oh, open happiness. What What is going on in my brain? And I need to pull up something from inside me to, to not let that progress on to, into a behavior. 
like going and getting the, the toxic product. No, so on autopilot, we are like these commercials are incredibly compelling, right? People are happy. They're doing amazing things. They're living these incredible lives. We, you know, we're subconsciously believing that we're going to have that too. And then you have the addiction quality of, yes, these, these products have been designed so that we desire them over and over and over again. The high and the crash. Yeah. So um, there are a few things that we use to really, because there, the stakes are like high and there's a lot of- Oh well, gosh, this is life or death. Yeah. So we use something, the brain likes black and white. Um, so again, this came out of functional imagery training. It's, it's called mental contrasting. So what if, if you're working with somebody um, with whatever the addiction is, what if nothing changes? What is that like? A years from now. Oh, that's a great image. Oh my gosh. And usually people, um, and you really, you let them be there for a few seconds and let it develop in their brain. What is that future like for you if you continue using this? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're not judging, you're just allowing, you're not adding any layers of it's going to look like this. Door. You're going to have no friends. And no, no, no. This is simply what is it going to look like for you? What's it going to mm -hmm. smell like? What's it going to taste like? And then someone comes back from that imagery experience that we've had them in for, you know, a few seconds, maybe a few minutes, and they report it's heavy, it's sad, they feel frustrated, alone, painful. Okay. Yeah, painful. It's painful. It's very painful. It's the hardest part of this work for me, but we do it with every client. And then the second one is, okay, let's imagine you've made progress and you've taken, you know, little steps that have added to bigger steps. So it's a year from now and you have achieved something that you wanted to achieve from that. Mm -hmm. What is that? Like? And you allow them to go through a day of what's that like? They come back from that experience and they report like, that was light. I was bright. I, I had suddenly found my confidence. So mental contrasting, the brain really likes that. That's a choice point too, right? Mm -hmm. and you can be the refrigerator door, right? Mm -hmm. The door handle. You can feel the temperature of the door handle. What material is it? Your mm -hmm. open door, right? And that's mm -hmm. your cue to make a choice that's attached to that goal. The, the, right. the experience of you achieving. Right. right, right. So in that window, you are, so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're getting off of the autopilot that society that we live in now has engineered. It's to, a disruptor. Yeah. So you're getting off of that and you're taking control of your life. I mean, there's no... The way of you know, I, I do. I, I have this image where I literally reach out. The, the neuro, neurologists at the corporations, like they've got their, their claws into my brain and I literally reach out and I take my brain back from them. This is what we're doing and we're doing it through exactly what Joe is talking about. It's imaging. You can be more powerful in your brain than any neurologist at a, at a corporation can. All right, Joe. Well, actually, there's a little bit of, um, you know, when I do this work, that like we, there's science, right? And but Einstein said that, um, you know, that there's always magic, right? I think he, I forget exactly how he said it, but there's only so much we can measure. There's stuff that's out beyond what we have the ability to measure. Oh yes. And um, so I've had clients come back to me um, and say. You, you are you like is this like are, do, are you magic and I'll say what do you mean and they said well you remember that image I gave you of where I'd be working and what my office would look like and yes I remember it happened to the even the way the door swings in and where the window is and how did you do that and I said I didn't do it I can't explain to you why it happened but I'm just as in awe as you are of it, that that so there is something out beyond the measurable to a bit of magic that I've seen over and over again, people coming back to me saying, yeah, huh. it is, it does. It seems like magic because we don't practice it, 
the the corporations have taken all of that away from us but inside our brains we can create what we can create is endless yeah. yay joe all right tell us how people can stay connected with you okay. how can they so, get connected um, and stay connected yes we'd love to stay connected so if you go to imagerycoaching.com and sign up for our newsletter. We're also looking for bulk book buys. So if you want us to come onto your podcast or speak in front of your group, we're not charging anything right now. We're just getting bulk book buys. Um, and uh, and they can pre-order the book. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not an Amazon fan, so you can do it on through your local bookstore, Barnes and Noble, or and um, and then if they're really interested, like if they have some sort of background in MI. Um, then and then want to be trained with us. We are taking on um, a waiting list now. There is an interview process, but we're training first responders, therapists, um, coaches from around the world. It's an amazing. Yeah. So yeah, so stay right. connected with us, and then you know read the book. And we just launched an AI bot the other day, which someone said, "Oh my god, this is horrible! You're replacing humans." But we're never going to replace this bot. Will only be used with a coach. That you're working with so there's okay. a lot of exciting things on the horizon um and you can just stay in touch with us through our website and do you also i i should have asked you this beforehand but do you take individual appointments uh so we've trained i i i don't but um uh we have trained uh 40 or 50 coaches who then we can connect with people who want to be coached in this method so just they can just leave a mess a message at your website and and say I'd like a session with one yes. of your coaches. Yes, All right, right, and you'll set that up. Yes. All right. Well, this has been. I, I'm super excited about this. Uh, I've been in this field for 27 years, and this is the name of the game: powerful ways to to change the channel. Yes, we know these neurologists have created channels in our brains powerful ways to change the channel get control of your life and just also forgive yourself mm -hmm. until you have this kind of training it's not realistic to expect that you you can win i mean if you're going to fight somebody like a neurologist you you have to have training to 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 know exactly where that vulnerability is how do they get to you and how can you defend yourself and your loved ones uh, against this all right okay. and just a reminder do visit us at foodaddictionreset.com we have an online community we i don't know how it's going to look but we're going to get this functional imaging training to be part of our online community and joe i just thank you so much i appreciate you I appreciate and you. um i'll see you around the hood <laughs> okay